Grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. We'll give our attention again to the account of Jesus and his adversaries in John chapter 10. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were, gathered, who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the gospel of our Lord. Brothers and, and sisters, we don't see many shepherds here around these parts, but our, our unfamiliarity with them, despite that, when Jesus calls himself a shepherd, we, we can't not have an image of that in our mind. Maybe it's the, the shepherd like resting, the, the, the sheep resting in its shepherd's arms or, or the sheep draped across his shoulders while the rest of the flock ambles behind him through the green pastures to the quiet waters. Everything's peaceful. I'm going to ask you, though, to set that image aside for a few minutes. For, if for no other reason, just because of the plain fact that one of the main reasons that sheep need a shepherd is that things aren't always peaceful and perfect. There are, there are, are bears and, and, and lions out there, and if not for the shepherd, it's going to be an all-you-can-eat buffet down by the creek. So, so how, about, how about this morning, for the purpose of the sermon, we, we picture that, that, that gentle shepherd rolling up his sleeves and brandishing his crook and getting his fight on against anyone who dares to mess with his sheep. There are, there are passages that, that depict Jesus the shepherd leading his sheep to food and water. And there are passages that depict Jesus the shepherd setting out after his wandering sheep to bring them back into the fold. But, but this, this here is not one of those passages. This is the shepherd standing between the sheep and the lions. If he's not there, they're an easy breakfast. But that's not going to happen on his watch. No one will snatch them out of his hand. Let's set the stage. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's at the temple grounds walking through Solomon's colonnade. That, that temple, that, that was supposed to be uh, like the holy place of Jewish religious life, but it had turned into the lion's den. And Jesus recently had been poking the lions. For example, one of the things that he had done recently was that he had given sight to a 40-year-old man who had been born blind. And oh, that got under the skin of his enemies. Because if, if Jesus is doing that, it's pretty hard to dispute that he's from God. So that's going to get under your skin if you refuse to believe that he's from God. It's the, 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 the Feast of Dedication, it says. We have a different name for it today, usually. Hanukkah. It was winter. And Jesus' enemies, they, they, spot Jesus, they spot Jesus in the temple grounds, and the lions smell an opportunity. It says the Jews gathered around Jesus. Gather is too neutral. They, they surrounded Jesus. The predators were closing in. The shepherd was alone in, in the middle. Not going to get away this time, Jesus. 
How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I would think the tension here in this setting is through the roof. But Jesus is just like, uh, I did tell you. And, and I showed you, don't, don't you remember that guy who was blind his whole life and, and now he can see? And, and, and don't you remember how you drove yourselves crazy, how to, how, how to figure out how I can do that if I'm not sent from God? So th they're demanding that Jesus tell them plainly, but Jesus hadn't been dancing around the question. They just refused to believe the evidence. It reminds me of people today who, who deny God's existence, and they can explore the universe through telescopes and, and microscopes and then look up from all of that and, and claim, there's just no proof, even though the proof is staring at them in the face. The, the, the problem isn't a, a lack of evidence, and the problem isn't that their IQs are too low. It's just that they refuse to believe the evidence. With, with the Jews in Jerusalem, it was, it, it was, it was different in that they, they weren't denying God's existence. They were just denying that, that God sent Jesus. But even though they surround Jesus and Jesus is outnumbered and surrounded, you see what kind of shepherd he is? He doesn't back down or, or roll over. <laughs> Truth to power. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And from here on out, all of the rest of the words that Jesus speaks are about you. Not about how much smarter you are than people who don't believe in Jesus and follow him. No, the, the emphasis is here is on our, our weakness. We're sheep surrounded by lions. Completely helpless, but at the same time, invincible. Because of the shepherd. Because... Jesus really is who he says he is, and he, and he really does what he says he, he'll do. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And can we chew, can we chew for a few minutes uh, just on Jesus' words about his sheep in verse 28? I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So, so first of all, just to realize the obvious, that that there would be no need for assurances such as that if such things were always obvious to us. Um, we can divide everything that we need into two categories, I'd say. There are, in the first category, the things that we need that we just always assume are going to be there. Never give it a doubt. Uh, that the sun will rise in the morning, that there will be oxygen in the air that we breathe, that gravity is going to keep us from floating up into outer space. Those things, we just take them so for granted that we, are, we don't think about them. And then the second category of things that we need are those things that, well, they're, now, they're not always so obvious. We don't know if they're going to be there for us or if we can depend on them. That second category, those are the things that drive us to worry and fear. We can't control them. And then on top of those things, there's the enemies. We usually can't control them either. We can put some faces on that. Um, think about a, a little four-year-old girl that has cancer. I think that's common enough that we can call that a thing. And, and, and the last time that she was in the hospital was when she was born. 
And everyone was so happy. And, and the next Sunday, God laid, claimed her as his, his own dear forgiven child through baptism. But now she's chained to a hospital bed with tubes of every sort, and, and she's never been so scared, and her parents have never felt so helpless. We can put more faces on that. The Christian wife with an abusive husband and four kids to feed. Or the Christian man with a cheating wife with four kids who need a mom. Or the, the Christian who, who just despises himself for his own addiction and, and he, he, he frequently repents of it, but then he, he keeps on getting sucked back into it, and he's afraid to tell anybody else about it for, for shame, and at the same time, he realizes that it's destroying his soul. For, for, for Christians like that, that they have a, a shepherd, a, a good shepherd, a, a faithful and abiding God, that is not as obvious as the sunrise. And that's why Jesus says this. That's why Jesus says it, and he shows that his enemies can't stop him from saying it. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. If, if you're ever in, in, in dark moments like that, when it seems like, like God is gone, then maybe you have like an inkling of what the, the, the Jews were thinking when they surrounded Jesus in the temple courts. Um, like them, you, you, you don't deny, you probably don't deny God's existence, but that, but that God sent Jesus for you, and not just for you, but for that moment of darkness. Well, you're starting to wonder. Because you cannot see it you cannot feel it, and, and maybe your words kind of harmonize with what the Jews were saying. If you are the Christ, if you really are who you say you are, then, then prove it. When, we, when we're in those dark moments and we start thinking like that, then our thoughts can be like this pendulum that just swings back and forth between anger, maybe on one end, and hopelessness on the other end. Anger that God isn't doing anything about it. Hopelessness because you're not trusting him to do anything about it. And it just spirals down further and further. Maybe you wonder whether you really are his sheep because maybe I'm falling short of the minimum threshold of listening and following Jesus doesn't let us in on this confrontation between him and his enemies to make us wonder whether we really are his sheep. He shows us himself going toe-to-toe -to -toe with his enemies to teach us that we can depend on him. No matter how, how weak or angry or hopeless you are, the shepherd is standing by his sheep and no one will snatch them out of his hand. Just a, a, a super quick 30-second Greek grammar lesson. In the Greek language, that Greek language doesn't use um, pronouns nearly as often as, as English does. Uh, in, in Greek, it's, it's content for the, the reader to infer the, the pronouns from, from the context unless it's necessary to make it clear um, or, or to emphasize it. Um, but here Jesus throws that convention out the window and he throws pronouns all over the place. Words like I and me and my sprinkled all over the passage. It's all for emphasis. It's like Jesus saying, is saying, these sheep, my sheep. I'm the good shepherd and I'm doing my job. 
And, my, and when their shepherd is with them, the, their enemies can't snatch them out of my hand because I'm on duty and I am always on duty. The, the way that Jesus sees it, his, his father has entrusted something precious to his care and he's not going to let his father down. To lose any of his sheep, you know, that, that would be an affront to Jesus' very nature because he and his father are one. He's doing something bold here. He's warning his enemies. If you try to stand against me, I and the father are one. You're taking a stand against God. And if you take a stand against God, you are going to lose. Hanukkah that happened at, right? That's December. Um, about three months later, uh, Jesus was back in Jerusalem in the springtime for a different festival. That was for the, the, the festival of Passover. And, and they do it again. Jesus' enemies, they surround him once more. And, and they bring up that, that, that whole Messiah thing again. Like, Jesus, you got to prove it. I'm sure we all know this one. This is the way they said it. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. And there's nothing about, nothing even close to Jesus rolling up his sleeves. And, and it looks like well, the lions win. But you know what Jesus was doing. He was keeping his promise. I laid down my life for the sheep. The good shepherd laid down his life to take away your sin and your anger and your doubt and to wash it all clean. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep and you are his sheep. But can I point something out about the order of things? The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, but we don't focus on Jesus, the good shepherd, during the season of Lent when it's about Jesus suffering and dying. We save it for Easter because the good shepherd who died isn't dead. He's rolled up his sleeves and no one is going to snatch his sheep out of his hand. Not even the not, not even the, the, the four-year-old four with cancer or the Christian wife with an abusive husband or the, or the Christian husband with a cheating wife or the Christian who's, who's crying out, out under the weight of his own addiction. But, but maybe, maybe one of those Christians that's in that dark moment is, is thinking, uh, no, you don't understand. It's not getting any better. And I'm only getting weaker. I can't do this. And you know how Jesus responds to an objection like that? He says, well, that's what I'm for. That's what this whole shepherding thing is about. It's not by your strength, Jesus says. It's by, it's by mine. By, by his strength, the, the sun rises every morning and gravity keeps us from floating up into outer space. And it's by that, that same strength coupled with his eternal, undying love for you that no one, no matter what, can snatch you out of his hand. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how much you don't have, you have his promise. How does it go? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. 
I'm with you, Jesus says. I'm for you, that means. And those words, they're not just words. My sheep listen to my voice. Let's get this straight. That whole listening thing, that's not proof of your strength. That's the antidote to your weakness. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus says, I'm with you. I'm for you. And those words aren't just words. My sheep follow me. Let's get that straight too. Jesus is not saying that his sheep are, are experts at navigating through life. Think it through. Where are you when you follow? Well, if no one can snatch you out of his hand, that means you're in his hand. And in his father's hand, he's carrying you. The, 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 the image of, of the, the sheep in his shepherd's arms are draped across his shoulders. That's you. Even in the valley of the shadow of death. No one can snatch you out. And then, and then Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 shows us a scene where, where the lions and the cancer and the, the broken and awful relationships are no more. When, when your shepherd, when he, when he sets you down in glory, did you notice this when we read it in Revelation? He's still your shepherd. The, the, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead you to springs of living water, everything peaceful and perfect. And God will wipe away every tear, every tear that you've ever shed from your eyes. Amen.